God, as we gather into your house this morning, and as we gather from all sorts of different places and weeks and experiences and with different challenges and joys and celebrations and all sorts of different things on our hearts and minds, God, we pray that you'd gather us together now, our thoughts around you and your word. Lord, and we pray that whether this is our first time in church for a long time, or we've been watching online, or we've been uh, just out in the hub watching from there, whatever's been going on, God, we pray that you'd speak loudly and clearly through your word now as you've promised to do, and by your spirit we ask it. Amen. All of our guests bring joy, some by coming, others by leaving. You ever seen that sign at somebody's house? Have you ever wondered which guest you might be? My family had that house, a uh, sign in our house, and I remember when it went up thinking, that seems a little strange, but it's true. Some guests bring joy by coming, others by leaving, and this morning we're going to talk about Jesus as he uh, comes to earth and as he leaves again, as we think specifically about the ascension. Is that good news or bad news for us, or does it mean anything to us at all? All. That's what we're going to dig into this morning. And I think it's significant for lots of reasons, but one reason is this. The work of God and the work of Jesus isn't ancient history. It's not something past, but it continues today. It's ongoing today. Just like last week we celebrated a baptism and hearing students' testimonies and communion, all sorts of different things. He continues to work right now in us by his word and by his Holy Spirit. And so I do think it's significant. Luke, uh, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and then also Acts, records the Ascension twice. And we're going to read both of them. Uh, one of them is very short. Uh, but let's read both of those uh, now as we get started. This first one is from Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into uh, heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's the first one from Acts one, and so you get the picture, Jesus is there with his disciples, and as they're talking, interacting, suddenly Jesus is lifted up. He ascends into heaven. Have you ever pictured that scenario in your mind? What does that look like? Like, are they just standing there talking, and all of a sudden Jesus starts just getting a little higher and higher, and kind of just drifting away like a hot air balloon? Or is it more like a Marvel superhero, where he like puts his hand on his hip and one in the air, and... It's kind of an unusual picture, isn't it? But there the disciples are. They've been hanging out with them. Suddenly Jesus goes up, and then they're just standing there. You see him still? Yeah, I think I see it. No, no, that's a cloud. That's a bird. It's not a plane uh, yet. But anyway, they're just standing there waiting, and then all of a sudden these two men appear who we assume are angels and say, what are you guys doing? Uh, why are you staring up into the sky? Jesus who ascended will come down in the same way that he went up. Off you go. Is that good news or bad news? In Luke, as he tells us this same event, he tells us very clearly that it's good news. Listen to this. It says this, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So here Luke gives us a bit of different information. They're not in Jerusalem. They're outside uh, near this town called Bethany. And uh, as Jesus ascends up, they celebrate. They're like, this is amazing. This is the best news ever. They worship him. They celebrate. And then off they go to the temple where I assume they're telling people about him and giving thanks to God for Jesus and what he has done for them and with them. Here's, uh, I do want to share with you this morning kind of four reasons why I think the ascension is important to us. And one of them is that Jesus' ascension tells us that he has finished his mission. Jesus comes to earth on a mission. We're told different kind of, uh, uh, kind of nutshell sentences about it. Like he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Or he came uh, that we might have life and have it to the full. Kind of different phrases like that. But the ascension tells us Jesus has done it all. 
It's all done now. He's lived his life. He's fulfilled all the prophecies he needs to fulfill. He's died. He's risen again. He's conquered sin, death, and the devil. All these different things. And so him going up now is him saying, it's all done. Everything on the checklist. Do any of you ever start a day or a weekend with a to-do list? Doesn't it feel so good when you check everything off? That's actually a question. I've never done it before. <laughs> have you ever checked everything off the list? My list has carryover. I have carryover on my list from like last year or the year before. I know. I'll get to it. I probably never will. But here Jesus, his ascension tells us he's checked everything off the list. And now he goes up into heaven because it's all done. In John 17, he says this. He's uh, praying and he says this to his father. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Something we sometimes, I think, lose a bit of track of is that Jesus didn't just begin to exist on Christmas, right, when he was born or at the uh, conception. That wasn't the beginning of Jesus. He always existed with God the Father in heaven before that, and he always exists into the future because he's God. And so he's eternal and so in coming to earth he lays some of that glory aside and now as he's preparing to be ascended or raised up into heaven he says father i've done everything you asked me to do now take me back up to heaven and give me that glory i had with you before that and so the ascension is god the father giving jesus the gold star absolutely you've done it uh, a plus everything that you needed to or wanted to accomplish has been done any of you ever get an A plus? Is that good news or bad news? Good news. The ascension of Jesus is good news that he's accomplished what he set out to do for us. It's good news for us. That's kind of good news for Jesus. He did what he wanted to do. But the good news for us is he wanted to come and save us. And in the ascension, he says, done it. Check that off the list. It's accomplished. And that's good news for us because it means you don't have to be good enough or pray hard enough, or put enough in the offering plate on your way out the doors, because Jesus has already paid it all. Everything you needed to get into heaven has already been done and given to you. Not only does he get the approval of God his Father, but there's a prize. I want to read this for you from Ephesians 1. It says this, He worked in Christ, this is uh, talking about God the Father, He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in his, this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Did you catch the prize? Jesus ascends up to heaven and sits at the right hand, not on the right hand of God, but at the right hand of God, the seat of authority and power. He sits right there with God on this throne that has been prepared for him. Pastor Alistair McGrath summarizes the ascension uh, this way. He says, he came down to earth from heaven in great humility. He returns to heaven in triumph and glory, accomplishing all that was necessary for our salvation. The first reason the ascension is good news is it means Jesus has done it all, checked everything off his list for us. The second reason it's good news is that he continues to work in heaven for us. I'm curious, how many people here, by a show of hands, have retired? How many people here are retired? Okay, and how many of you, when you retired, then got another job? Yeah, lots of you have done that, right? And it's really common to have a really good paying job with benefits and holidays, and you quit that and you get a part-time job where you're paid very poorly with no benefits and no holiday time, but you get a blue vest that says Walmart on it. So that's reward enough in itself, right? It's very common to finish, I don't know why, but you finish one job and then you're like, well, this is boring, I gotta do something. So you retire and you get another job. Jesus has finished everything he intended to do, so he ascends to heaven, but he doesn't retire. He's still working today. And I want to read this for you from Hebrews 7. It says this, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 
For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who's been made perfect forever. So it's saying a number of things. The first is that there used to be a whole bunch of priests. You needed lots of priests because some of them got holiday time. So then you'd have other priests come in and there was this rotation. Hundreds, even thousands of priests who would work in the temple. And in the temple there was no chairs for the priests to sit down. Why? Their work was never, ever finished. And so this tells us we needed lots of priests. First, because of all the work that had to be done. But secondly, some of those guys would go off and die. Then he needed to hire another one to fill in his place. After he got his Walmart vest, worked a few years there, then he died. He needed another priest to come in and fill in for him. And so there's this constant rotation of needing new priests to come in and work in the temple. But their job was never, ever finished. And it's interesting here, it tells us their first thing when they, when they came on shift, when it was their shift at the temple, the first thing they had to do was offer a sacrifice for whose sins? Their own. Because they were just sinful, regular guys like everybody else. So they'd show up at the temple. There'd be a lineup of people waiting for, to offer their ox or pigeon or lamb or whatever it is. I'm not a priest. Never bring me an ox here. I'd have no idea what to do with it. But that's what they would do. They'd sacrifice all these things. And so the person would show up and the priest would say, hold on. First I have to make my sacrifice for my own sin. But here it says Jesus doesn't have to offer any sacrifices for himself. Because he's already perfect. He's got nothing to be forgiven for. And then it says, actually, he's not busy offering sacrifices at all. Because when he gave himself on the cross, that was sacrifice enough to cover and end all other sacrifices forever. The penalty of death has been paid in full by him. So Jesus' job now is being our high priest in heaven where he mediates for us, he intercedes for us, is what it says in Hebrews 7. And the reason he has to do that is because the Bible tells us in Revelation that uh, the devil is in heaven 24-7, 365 days a year, accusing us. Do you know what they did? Did you just see that? Did you hear that? Did you see what they were thinking? Do you know what's going on here? That guy's cheating. That person's having an affair. That one's person, that person's, uh, I don't know, stole a pencil from work. That person's a liar. That person's addicted to pornography. That person, on and on and on. 24-7, he just never stops accusing people. If the devil in heaven were talking to God right now about you, what would he be saying? What's the accusation he'd be making, the addiction, the temptation that lures you in again and again? Did you see that? They're still doing that. They said they were going to stop. They confessed, said they'd repent, but they're at it again. So there's God the Father in heaven. There's Jesus, and there's the devil who just keeps on uh, accusing, accusing, accusing. And Jesus keeps mediating and saying, I paid for that. That's been paid for. That's forgiven. That's an outright lie. And so we have this kind of triangle happening where all these things are going on. Remember earlier we said that Jesus has a throne? No other priest could sit down because their work was never done. Jesus has a throne because his work is finished. Not only that, but it tells us in Psalm 110, and then it told us in our reading earlier, that he also has a footstool in heaven. In Psalm 110 it says that God will give to him a footstool of his enemy. So I want, I want a little bit of help to sort this out. And maybe, I'll, Sam, I'm going to ask you to help. And Joshua, would you help me? Might as well. Come on up, you guys. Let's give these guys a round of applause. This is good. Okay. Which one of you? You can be God the Father, okay, Sam? So you can sit here in the middle. That's your throne. And you can sit on his right-hand side. You can be Jesus. Yeah, that's right. That's the right hand. <laughs> you got it. You don't have to sit lower than him. You can sit right Yeah. Okay, so you're the father, and you're Jesus, and I'm the devil, and I'm accusing people. Did you see what that guy did? Do you see what that guy did? And you're turning to the father saying, I've paid for it. It's forgiven. Go ahead. I've paid for it. It's forgiven. It was very compelling when he said it, wasn't it? I mean, I believed him. (laughs) But the interesting thing here is, the devil's not dancing around, running around, doing whatever he wants. In fact, I'm a footstool. 
Right? That's what it says, that his enemies will be made his footstool. So go ahead, get comfy, Joshua. Am I stepping on No, you put your feet... Do you not have a footstool? Sit down. <laughs> this, <laughs> this isn't wrestling. <laughs> this is terrible. Okay, you just put your feet on me. Do I look like I'm in a powerful position right now? No. So then the devil's down here saying, do you see that guy? That guy's a liar. That person's a cheater. And what are you saying? I it, what? Yes, say it. <laughs> you get the point. So the devil's up there. He's accusing. Jesus is like, this is no big deal for me. I've already paid for it. I've already arrested them. You guys can go sit down. Thanks for your help. Sam, you nailed it. Thank you. But I love that picture because that's what Scripture tells us, that God has made Jesus' enemies his footstool, and in the death, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus has the name that is above every name. He is higher than any other powers. There's no person who can challenge him. And so it's not like he's there's not a lot of stress in heaven. There's none at all because Jesus is saying, I paid for that. My sacrifice covers that. We've adopted them. That's our son. That's our daughter. We love them. Those accusations are false. Or those accusations, even if they're true, have already been paid for in full. I love that image of what's going on in heaven. The accusations that you play in your mind against yourself. Man, I'm so guilty. I'm so awful. I'm so terrible. I'm so bad. I shouldn't have done that. Jesus in heaven is responding saying, I've paid for it. They're forgiven. They're set free. They're released. We love them. We've paid for them. I mean, it's just this beautiful, beautiful picture that Satan has been defeated, even though he's still running around accusing, getting trampled on by Jesus. And it makes me think back to Genesis 3, where God the Father says that he will, that the, the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And there in heaven, Jesus is still crushing them, right under his feet, right where he belongs. Good news or bad news? That Jesus is still working for us. Good news or bad news? Good news. It's good news. I mean, that should give us such hope and comfort as we think about that picture. Two other reasons why I think the ascension is good news that I'll just go through pretty quickly. First, Jesus said it was good that he would go to heaven and leave them. Why? Because if he did that, then he could send the Holy Spirit to them. Do you remember that where he does that? They're kind of in turmoil. He says, hold on, this is all good news. I'm going to go to heaven. The, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come and be with you. Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus ever come to Canada? North America. Did Jesus ever make a quick trip to North America? Hop a plane, fly over here. Don't tell your Mormon friends that. They'll be very upset with you. Jesus did not come to North America. Ever. In his whole life. Now... The Holy Spirit is everywhere. In fact, we believe that even in the ascension, as Jesus is on the, at the right, not on, but at the right hand of God the Father, that now that he's fully in his glory again, that Jesus also can be present everywhere on the throne, but also present with us as we baptize, as we gather around his word, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that Jesus is present everywhere. So it's better for us now because he's not just in one spot, one place, one person at a time. Now God goes out everywhere by his spirit, through his word, and even Jesus is present with us even now. Again, that should be hugely comforting for us as we think about, man, wouldn't it be great to go back and be able to be in the presence of Jesus? He's present here. He's present with you. He's present all of the time because God is always and ever present. The last reason I want to share with you why the ascension is good news is straight from Jesus. You will know this verse. It says this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus says, hey, this is good news that I'm going. Because when I go, I'll prepare a place for you, and I'm coming back to get you. The ascension is good news because it means we're that much closer to heaven, that much closer to God coming to bring us to be with him. Has anyone here been uh, to Israel, been on a tour of Israel before? 
Yeah, okay, and so if you do that tour, sometimes, I don't know about your tours, but you can go as part of a tour to the uh, place of the Ascension. Did, maybe you did that, and I, I believe there's three different places that they will take you, because they don't know for sure where it was. So depending on what tour you are on, you get taken to different places. When I was there, I got taken to this place, the Stone of Ascension, and in there's this stone that has a footprint imprinted into the stone. And so the story is that when Jesus blasted off, <laughs> You know, there's enough force that his foot is there in the stone. If you believe that, I have some investment opportunities. I could use your money and I can triple it today probably. I'm just kidding. I don't think that it's Jesus' foot in the stone. Uh, but there's these different places that it'll take you to. We don't know where he uh, ascended from. Not exactly. We know it's close to Bethany outside of the city of Jerusalem. And it doesn't matter. The more important thing isn't where he went from, but that he has ascended and that he's promised to come back. And just like he's checked off all those other prophecies and all those other promises, he's going to check that one off his list too when the time is right. When is that going to be? I have no idea. But it's good news to know that the one who has conquered sin and death for you is then going to come to bring you there. How are you going to get to heaven otherwise? I don't know. I don't know the way. That's what the disciples said to Jesus right after he said this. We don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. And Jesus says, I'm the way. I'll come and get you. And so that's good news for us as well. The ascension of Jesus matters. It tells us that Jesus succeeded in saving us. There's nothing left for us to do. The ascension matters because when we hear that condemning voice in our head, there's an echo in heaven saying, not true, forgiven, set free, loved, chosen, redeemed. And so the good, uh, ascension is good news because Jesus is in heaven mediating for us. The ascension is good news because not only did Jesus go to heaven, but he also then sends the Holy Spirit and he's present with us in a real way now. And the ascension is good news because what goes up comes back down and Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is full of good news for us and full of uh, truth and things that should bring us hope and comfort as we trust in you. Lord, we thank you that, uh, Jesus, that your job isn't done. It's not that you've retired, but you've accomplished everything that you intended to here. And that now you're at work in heaven, interceding and mediating for us, and that you're also active in ministry through the world, through your people. And so we pray that we would be um, faithful to that and that would be faithful to your voice and faithful to your leading and faithful to your calling on us and God I, did, I don't know everyone's story here how their week has been how their year's been how COVID was for them how where they're at in their relationship with you but I pray that they hear this morning that they are loved by you and known by you and that you are the most powerful being in the universe and that there's no one's voice or approval or love, or forgiveness, who can mean anything close to as much as yours does. And so I pray that we'd find our hope, and our comfort, and our identity in you. Lord, we pray for those who are mourning, or grieving, or wrestling, or struggling. And this morning we think of uh, Lucas and his family at the passing of his grandfather, Klaus. We ask you just to encourage them and lift them up. Lord, we pray for those who struggle with mental health. We pray that you would just give them freedom from that, and that you'd use... Uh, your spirit and counselors and medication, whatever else it needs for them to have just balance in their lives. Lord, we pray for those who are uh, struggling with grief or despair. We pray for those who are struggling with addiction, that they would just have freedom, that they would just have no desire or appetite for those things that lure them in. Lord, we pray for every marriage represented here, just that you'd build them up and strengthen them. We pray for parents here, that they just have divine wisdom and insight. We pray for those who lead and serve and do so sacrificially, that they would be refueled and energized. And Lord, we pray for our children. We pray that our children would know you and that they would just surprise and delight us with their faith and that they'd be pillars of faith in our families, our church, our school, our neighborhoods. Lord, for everything else going on, we commit all those things to you, knowing that you're good, knowing that you are hearing our prayers and answering us. And this morning we pray the prayer that you, Jesus, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand as we speak together the words of our Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Whence you will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.